Hey everyone, Israel is currently in a war against the terror organization Hamas, and we know how hard it can be to keep up with all the news. So if you haven't had the time to stay on top of the latest developments out of Israel, we're here for you. I'm Lajar Gavelazi, and this is ILTV's Weekly Review. We begin today with the news of a terror attack carried out this morning against Israelis in a shopping mall in northern Israel in Carmiel. First responders reported that two people were injured, including one critically. The Israel police stated that the terrorist had been thwarted. Big news from Lebanon as the IDF successfully assassinated a senior Hezbollah field commander in an Israeli airstrike. The terrorist killed was initially identified as Abu Ali Nasser, the head of the Aziz unit in Lebanon. On the diplomatic front, efforts are underway to ensure that Hezbollah will cease cross-border attacks on Israel if and when a ceasefire is declared in Gaza and war could be avoided. Meanwhile, the cross-border exchanges are continuing and the North continues to burn. ILTV's Steve Leibowitz reports. Multiple firefighting crews were called in to battle a blaze near Kiryat Shmona, sparked by Hezbollah rocket fire from Lebanon. Teams worked for hours to extinguish the blaze from spreading to nearby homes. Tens of rockets were intercepted by air defense and other impacts caused no injuries. Hezbollah claimed responsibility for the attack, saying it launched dozens of Katusha rockets at a military base in the area. The IDF responded with fighter jets striking Hezbollah targets in several towns in southern Lebanon. The targets included a building used by the terror group. The IDF also deployed artillery in several towns to remove threats when detected. Meanwhile, the deputy leader of Hezbollah, Sheikh Naim Qasim, says the group cannot say if it would halt hostilities against Israel should the war in Gaza wind down without a formal ceasefire. He said Hezbollah's participation in the war has been as a support front for its ally, and if the war stops, this military support will no longer exist. French President Emmanuel Macron called Prime Minister Netanyahu, urging a diplomatic solution to avoid war in Lebanon and to prevent a conflagration. Macron reiterated his serious concern over what he described as a deepening of tensions between Hezbollah and Israel that would harm the interests of both Lebanon and Israel. And according to a Jerusalem Post report, the Lebanese Foreign Minister Habib sent a special third-party message to Foreign Minister Israel Katz, explaining to him that his country did not want war to break out between them. We are interested in peace, the message said. We do not want war. The statement was delivered through the Azeri foreign minister, who reportedly spoke with Katz. Well, after the New York Times report of a possible truce of some kind that unnamed officials in the IDF are allegedly seeking, here to discuss the situation is Israeli MK Boaz Bismuth. Boaz, thanks so much for joining us today. I want to start with something positive. Uh, the newly announced friendship, parliamentary friendship uh, council between the United States House of Representatives and the Knesset. Can you tell us more about this new, new committee? First of all, I'm very happy to be part of this new committee this morning. I must admit that when I woke up and I went to the Knesset as a new uh, member of this uh, friend, or co-chair of this uh, friendship group, I mean, I felt very, very proud because in those rainy days that we have, in those very challenging days that we have right now, to have such a group is important. As you know, I mean, where Israel is at war, and it's not a short war, it's a long and tough war, and friendship is important, especially friendship with our biggest ally, which is the United States of America. It was great to see, I mean, our friends coming here and showing support and we need we need that legitimacy from the Americans and this uh, uh, friendly friendship group will uh, do all it can in order to on the contrary uh, comfort more and more the American friendship here in Israel and vice versa I have to admit I was a little bit shocked as an Israeli American myself that there wasn't already a friendship council I understand the US House of Representatives has only six and now Israel what kind of activities will you guys be conducting through this friendship council <clears throat> So first of all, I mean, you are not the only one surprised. When I was proposed, I mean, being the co-chair, I was I was uh, surprised myself. By the way, I must uh, uh, admit that I'm very, although his opposition, uh, the fact that he done all is with me, I'm very uh, happy. I think he will do also an excellent job. Uh, what can I say? What is our challenge? Our challenge, of course, is the friendship between the two nations, also fighting anti-Semitism, legitimacy, and maintaining, maintaining this friendship. I must tell you one thing, I mean, when we speak of America and Israel, yesterday, I mean, we uh, visited with our American 
American friends, with American congressmen, we uh, uh, visited the uh, Kfaraza in the south. And we saw over there one of the uh, survivors, uh, uh, and he spoke over there, one of those, uh, Shachar his name is, and he was talking about the fact that you can see the light in the darkness that we have right now. And when he said that, when he spoke about light, I think of America, America with its values, America with its imposing, by the way, imposing in brackets or without its values on the world. I think Israel is doing exactly the same thing. And this is why I think that this, how would I say, this friendship group, and I, I, I am in other friendship groups, but this one is not only about rationality, as usually you have in international relationship between countries, it has also to do a lot with emotions, because America and Israel, yes, you can say that. It's also not only a rational, it's also a love story, and this is something that is, uh, should be done, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Absolutely. Shared values is a, a core part of this allyship. Getting a little bit more political, I wanted to ask you about the New York Times report, which claimed that some IDF officials are perhaps open to some kind of truce that may leave Hamas in power. Where is this coming from, and are there growing tensions between IDF leadership and the government? Well, tension between IDF leadership and the uh, Israeli government, if you want. Uh, you know, for months, people went out to the street and were talking or claiming democracy, and they were much worried about democracy uh, in Israel. Now, in democracy, I'll tell you how it functions. You know, it's government. Government takes decision, and the army executes. This is how it functions. There are parts in history where I would see something not exactly uh, similar, but it was, for example, in Turkey, when you needed the military in order to maintain democracy. Israel, thank God, is not there. We're a democracy a very, how would I say, a very healthy one. And in a democracy, army execute, army does not decide. This is how it was, and this is how it will continue. And uh, whether uh, some American medias like it or not, this is why I'm in this headline. I will take it in a very skeptical way. And I would say that if anyone imagines that uh, uh, the army can take decisions, well, they're totally wrong. Israel is a democracy. This is, no, uh, this is not the way it functions. And by the way, when we decide, when we take dec decisions, we, I mean, uh, uh, won elections for that, you know. So it means the decision is for the people, and we obey what they asked. Uh, last question. We are running out of time, but I wanted to get your take on this regarding the northern front. Of course, we've seen continuous escalation by Hezbollah. Now the Lebanese foreign minister is perhaps signaling that they don't want a war. Is there any chance to actually avoid a war when dealing with Hezbollah? So that's exactly what we talked about this morning with our American friends. I mean, the fact that you mustn't forget one thing. Hezbollah is operating from Lebanon. Lebanon is a sovereign state. I mean, and states and countries like France, like United Kingdom, like America, they've got embassies in Beirut. And they must always remember that in Beirut, you've got a parliament over there, seats members of Hezbollah, a terrorist organization. Meaning, in order to fix this problem of Hezbollah, of terrorism in Lebanon, you must also, how would I say, go to the root of the problem, which is also Lebanon by itself. I'm not saying that tomorrow Israel is going to war against the state of Lebanon, but I'm saying that Lebanese, Lebanese state accepts a terrorist group inside their own parliament, meaning, I mean, big countries have to take also responsibilities in the Middle East, and what was before the 7th will not be after, meaning a terrorist entity will not govern in the south, meaning in Gaza, absolutely, a terrorist absolutely. entity will not govern in the north in Lebanon. Uh, thank you so much. We are out of time, Boaz, but I want to thank you for your insights. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Day 271 of the war in Gaza. The IDF says the Rafah Brigade has been decimated with at least 900 terror operatives killed amid the ongoing IDF operation. Visiting troops in southern Gaza, IDF Chief Halevi said that the military will continue to destroy Hamas infrastructure in Rafah, including its tunnels, as the army enters a new phase of the fighting. Prime Minister Netanyahu rejected reports that the war could end with Hamas still in control. ILTV's Steve Leibowitz has the report. Chief of Staff Alevi confirmed the decimation of the Hamas Rafa Brigade and said that the IDF will continue to destroy Hamas's tunnel infrastructure in Rafa. <laughs> בתוכם גם מפקדים, לפחות מפקד גדוד אחד, הרבה מ"פים והרבה פעילים. המאמץ עכשיו, והסיבה שאנחנו עובדים כאן עוד שבוע ועוד שבוע, הוא עכשיו המאמץ על השמדת התשתיות, ועל השמדת התשתיות בתת-קרקע, וזה לוקח זמן. הלוי אמר שיש עוד הרבה עבודה לעשות ברפה. יש אנשים שהרגנו בתת-קרקע, יש אנשים שניסו לצאת והרגנו. והמאמץ הזה שלנו, המתמשך, הרדיפה הזו, 
היא מאוד מאוד חשובה, שהם ירגישו מותשים. Halevi explained that the IDF was moving into the third and final phase of the war. בנחישות, בהתמדה, באורך רוח, הופכים את זה להתשה לצד השני ולמימוש המשימות מבחינתנו. Prime Minister Netanyahu issued a statement blasting anonymous sources in the IDF who were quoted telling the New York Times that Israel's military leadership wants a ceasefire in Gaza, even if it leaves Hamas in power for the time being. <laughs> לפני השגת כל מטרותיה. אני לא יודע מי הם אותם גורמים על אומי שם, אבל אני כאן כדי להעביר חד משמעית, זה לא יקרה. אנחנו נסיים את המלחמה רק לאחר שנשיג את כל מטרותיה, לרבות חיסול החמאס ושחרור כל חטופינו. הדרג המדיני הגדיר לצה"ל את המטרות הללו. Meanwhile, Gazan civilians continue to flee the Khan Yunus area following an army order after 20 shells were fired from the city toward Israel. The IDF said forces struck targets in the Khan Yunus area from which the rockets were launched. It said the evacuation order was intended to protect civilians from the airstrikes, but ground forces would not re-enter the city, at least not at this time. Air Force jets bombed targets overnight, including including a weapons depot, operational centers, and additional terror infrastructure. An emergency landing in Turkey turned into a diplomatic debacle for an Israeli airliner when it was refused refueling services, forcing the plane to depart for Greece after a three-hour delay. This incident underscored the strained relations between Israel and Turkey, which have deteriorated since the start of the Gaza conflict. ILTV's editor-in-chief Mayan Hoffman has more. An Israeli airliner was refused refueling services after making an emergency landing in Turkey yesterday. El Al Flight LY5102 from Warsaw to Tel Aviv was diverted to Turkey after a passenger took ill and required urgent medical care. Israeli media reported that the plane had initially received permission to refuel at the airport, but Turkish political parties delayed this decision because permits were required to refuel. Instead, after a three-hour delay, the plane departed for Rhodes, Greece, to refuel there before continuing to Israel. Hebrew media reports said the Turkish authorities had assured the foreign ministry that the plane would be allowed to refuel, but in practice, it did not happen. Since the aircraft was burning fuel on the tarmac to keep air conditioning and other systems functioning, it was decided to take off for Rhodes, a 40-minute flight away, and refuel there before even that short flight became impossible. Passengers were informed they could not disembark in Turkey during the wait. Direct flights between Turkey and Israel have been canceled since October, shortly after the Hamas massacre and the start of the Gaza war. Relations between Israel and Turkey have deteriorated significantly since then, including Turkey halting all trade with the Jewish state. Before the war, Turkey was a popular destination for Israeli tourists. Now, travel advisories from Israel's National Security Council warn against visiting due to safety concerns exacerbated by anti-Israeli rhetoric from Turkish officials, including President Erdogan himself. And recent events highlight a disturbing global trend of anti-Israel and anti-Semitic attacks, raising concerns about the increasing normalization of such behavior. These incidents occurring in diverse settings underscore the urgency of addressing and combating hate speech and violence. ILTV's Ariella Lachiani has more details. The University of Warwick Conservative Association faced backlash after recording surfaced showing members singing and dancing to Erica, a Nazi anthem, during the annual Black Tie Dinner. The song, associated with German Nazi forces during World War II, drew swift condemnation from the Union of Jewish Students. UJS criticized the students' actions as blatant and unhinged support for Nazism and called for decisive action from the university and the Conservative Party. The UWCA apologized, stating that the song was played briefly and was not part of the pre-planned music selection. However, the incident has prompted the university to review the material and engage with the Jewish society to address the issue.
In Brooklyn, a Jewish woman and her Catholic husband were assaulted by an Arabic-speaking family during a fifth grade graduation ceremony at PS 682. The altercation began when the Arabic-speaking family started shouting anti-Israel slogans, escalating into a physical attack. The husband was thrown to the ground, restrained and beaten, while the wife was knocked down and threatened. Their 16-year-old son was also punched in the face. Despite the apparent anti-Semitic nature of the attack, Initial reluctance by the NYPD to classify it as a hate crime has drawn criticism. Eventually, the hate crimes task force was brought in to investigate. The incident has been described as one of the worst cases of anti-Semitism in a New York public school in recent times. And in North Carolina, three pro-Israel activists were attacked at an anarchist book fair held at the West Asheville Library. The activists, who were attending a seminar on strategic lessons from the Palestinian resistance, were confronted by participants after being identified as Zionists. The situation escalated with one activist having her phone snatched and being punched while another was repeatedly hit and put in a headlock. An eight-year-old veteran among them was also assaulted. The police arrested one individual involved in the attack and further investigation is underway. All right, well, shifting across the pond to the U.S. elections, and there is much debate today in the Democratic Party over what should be done following President Joe Biden's disastrous debate performance against former President Donald Trump. Now, there have been calls widespread calls for Biden to withdraw from the race and make way for another perhaps more viable candidate to run against Trump. But the Biden camp has thus far rejected any notion of withdrawing from the race. Here to discuss the situation with us is Professor Gabriel Wyman of the University of Haifa. Professor Wyman, thank you so much for joining us. First off, what was your take on the presidential debate and President Biden's performance? Well, I think contrary to the, most of the commentators and the experts, I wasn't that shocked. I mean, we know Biden and we know Trump. We know that Trump can lie and can attack. And we know that Biden is not that good when it comes to television. He's not a young man. Um, talking on TV is not easy for him. So in a way, it was expected. Uh, no surprise. Now, there's a lot of chatter about what the Democrats should do at this point. Even some of the people who have been the biggest supporters of Biden, Thomas Friedman and The New York Times, have called to replace him. What are you hearing, and do you think it's actually possible that Biden would ever with agree to withdraw? Well, uh, again, I'm going against the current winds, calling for his resignation or giving up the race. I think he should go. Uh, especially since it's too late now to, to go back, to withdraw. But it's not the only argument. I think that, first of all, this is the first of two debates. Uh, in many debates, uh, the first one who failed won the elections. President Obama, for example, lost the first debate. So we have another debate to look, uh, to look for. Uh, second, uh, we have four months. Many things can happen in those four months including the uh, court procedures for uh, Donald Trump. And we don't know the results there and the impact. There are many events that can take place. So it's really uh, not decided yet. And more than that, uh, based on studies of past debates all over the world, including in Israel, Europe, and many in the US, the impact turns to fade away. Um, first of all, the impact is not that dramatic. Even in 1962, when Kennedy won the famous debate against Nixon, he really managed, and he was really uh, significantly much better, he managed to change the opinions of very, very few voters. So I would say that uh, uh, even though Biden lost, there are still four months. There are many things that can happen, and we have another debate to, to look for. And uh, don't forget, uh, Biden can change. Uh, it was, well, he slipped, that's for sure. Will he do it again? I'm not sure. Now, after the debate, we also saw harsh backlash from anti-Israel activists who, in fact, even held a march in New York yesterday claiming they should adopt the model of resistance, a.k.a. violence, uh, as both candidates are staunchly pro-Israel. Uh, they then marched in NYC with Hezbollah, Houthi, Hamas flags calling for intifada. What does this kind of conduct mean for the future of American democracy and what can be done to stop it? Well, I've been studying anti-Semitism on social media for a long time. 
uh, and we published several studies. Uh, one of the recent ones was on the role played by TikTok and videos on TikTok uh, promoting anti-Semitism. So I'm, I'm not surprised to see the rising waves of anti-Semitism. And I don't think it is related only to the fact that we have two presidents supporting two candidates, a president and a candidate supporting Israel. I think the U.S. generally is supportive when it comes to Israel. Uh, certainly, uh, President Biden did his best after 7th of October in a very impressive, I would say even emotional way, when he came over and he uh, supported us in more than just words. There were many actions too, and supply of ammunition and so on, um, let, let alone defending us against the Iranian attack. So I don't really see the rising anti-Semitism as a result of the recent uh, race between the two candidates. I think this rise, which is quite significant, has to do with many other factors, and the presidents or the candidates are not the real cause for it. Well, one of the reasons that they stated they were protesting was directly in response to the presidential debate because they were dissatisfied with the arguments between uh, former President Trump and current President Joe Biden about the Israel issue, including Trump's uh, derogatory comment about being a bad Palestinian. Uh, you don't think that has any bearing on the reaction that we see from the protests now? I've been monitoring anti-Semitism on social media for about a decade now. And I must tell you that whatever something happens, they will see it as an excuse uh, to demonstrate. It can be an attack on a hospital in Gaza. It can be a, a flotilla coming from Turkey to Gaza uh, uh, by Hamas. Any kind of event, any kind of uh, cause can be used as a platform. So I don't think uh, it is really that reason for that. The movement, the hate, uh, is already there. All, you, all they do is actually uh, capture the moment, uh, take the opportunity, uh, use a, a, an event, and write on the platform. Well, they are certainly not lacking in creativity when it comes to dealing with protests. Thank you, Professor Wyman. We are out of time, but thank you again for your insights. Thank you for having me. For more of the latest updates from Israel, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ILTV.TV or download the ILTV Plus app. That's it for ILTV's weekly review. Stay safe and see you next week.